student comes and they, they play a piece, it may sound very attractive to you, but it doesn't sound like what you see in the score. And there's a discrepancy. And let's say, let's say they play it, you know, not in an ugly or beautiful, but incorrect. Well, I, first of all, I try to find out what is the person doing. I ask them what they're doing. I ask them, why do they make certain choices? For example, as we were talking before, I said that freedom is the ability to make choices. The greater the number of choices, the greater the freedom. If you can only do it one way, if you can only play in a certain way, or play one way, there is a, there's no choice. And as a result, the person is a slave to that way of playing. If the person is a slave to that way of playing, eventually the person, like any slave, will revolt against the authority and either stop playing or, or learn to play badly. If a person comes in and plays totally differently from what the music has, uh, uh, what is written in the music, I ask the student, why did they make the change? Or is there a change that they made? Or perhaps there was a different way that the piece was written. For example, you take a take the Opus 27, number two, C sharp minor sonata of Beethoven. Everybody knows the piece, so there's no discussion. It's Moonlight Sonata, supposedly. And hold it for one moment. Jeez. That means there was a real accident out there. Well, you look at the so-called Moonlight Sonata, and you say, wait one second, turn it off, I'll get the phone. The Moonlight, Moonlight Sonata. Moonlight. <clears throat> student comes in and plays for me. So I ask the student, says Adagio Sostenuto. All right. Will you please explain to me why you are playing Adagio Sostenuto? The student looks at me and says, because that's what's written. I say, that's fine. Then why is it in cut time? Is it a sign? Is it written a la breve? Or a la breve. It's written a la breve. It's written a la breve. Why then are you playing it in 12? Because it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Two. Well, because I heard it on a recording. Okay, that's fine. Um, if you had never heard it on a recording, how would you play it? So then the student starts to think. Uh, and so that which other people might have thought as a change from the music, I already start to change the person by stimulating the quality of uh, options. The person doesn't have to play it in 12. They, they can don't. play it in four. They can play it in two. Question then arises. It's written pianissimo. OK. Then they come to that marvelous moment where it's D, O, D, ba, ba, where you have the dotted eighth and sixteenth. And I then ask them, were they aware that at that time that when you had a triplet and a quadruplet figure, that the quadruplet note went with the triplet note, that it was a way of playing? Historically? Historically. All right. Students said no, would say generally no, because they aren't aware of that. Then I asked them, well, do you know, of course, that what you're playing is not in time? And they say, why? Well, because it's It's not Because then that becomes a six in the right hand. It's not a four, it's a six. So then the rhythm is off. I then asked them, can we imagine that this was written for a forte piano and, this, uh, and, and a pedal forte piano in which you could pedal the bass and not the treble? Could be possible. And uh, is it possible? And to start to go through the piece this way, at that moment, the person has already done three or four options, three or four different possibilities. That gives the student the beginning of freedom. Oh, and bring, bring your car in just All a right. little bit. Come on in, Snuggles.
Hmm? I know she's working hard because her eyes sometimes close in her class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, nice you, 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 I'm picking up that you encounter in students that come to you, they've gotten into fixed patterns of thinking. That's correct. Or, or uh, patterns of thinking that limit their, their right. choices. Even when they're playing exactly as written, there are, then there comes the very interesting time of trying to understand why they play the music the way it's written and why the composer wrote it this way. And is, did the composer have alternative ideas? The possibilities are boundless. All of used to stimulate the student's awareness. For example, what we're talking about is, as for example, you take any work of Beethoven and you start to understand that there is no such thing as a subsidiary theme. There is no such thing as an accompaniment. That the, that the ma magnificence of Beethoven is that each note has a value, has a value in the total um, uh, structure of the work. And so even though you might, even though Beethoven may have written on the most trivial of matters, for example, you take the, any of the works of Beethoven, take the second movement of a Passionato, not exactly one of the most uh, magnificent yeah. themes. Or the later works even more so. Maybe. Sure. The, uh, you take anything of Beethoven and you will find that he has brought his thematic material down to almost triviality, almost to the, the barest fundamentals. Um, di ba ba, di ba ba, ba ba, di ba. It's not one of the greatest scenes, but what Beethoven does in his voicing, what he does with all of the other parts of the chord and how each part of the chord has its own life. And then you, you start to accept this monumentality of each note being as in that, that it is true democracy of music. All notes are of essentially of equal importance. The theme wasn't even his. I mean, you, he, he puts together this, this, this uh, masterpiece and he got the theme from a friend. That's Literally, right. <laughs> you've got, you got, you know, from anybody. From, yes. Well, now, when you start to teach people this, there comes a nobility of purpose. Why? Because there is a, there is something that's, that there is no such thing as one idea more important than another. All ideas are important. Schubert the way the, the music is written. And the same with Schoenberg. The, the usage of material, development of material, it's unbelievable. And uh, one tries to teach students to accept this and to understand this, to make it a part of their own life, and then experience that extraordinary feeling of just enjoying the possibilities of what a person can do with an instrument. The same thing is with sound. The same thing is with pedal. That we use all of these, we're, we're given such, extra, uh, such gifts, and the gifts are there, they are uh, for us to use. And like sometimes the student doesn't realize the gift that they have been given. Uh, the gift of choice. That's right. Or a gift which includes... The gift which includes choices. 
you make me think of something that has been said about great performers, great pianists, is that, I don't know whether I agree or whether you agree, but it's been said that a great performance gives a receptive listener the feeling that the performer has improvised the piece or composed the piece. Of course. It, and and I, I don't think that infers in a sloppy or in casual sense, but improvised in the sense of created it. Let's go back let's go back to the idea of not only choice, but something even more important. Freedom is important. Oh yes. But life is important. You know, we come to this, uh, to that which um, Tom Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of, Lib uh, of Independence. Life, freedom or liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those three things always intrigue me. Life is terribly important. Liberty is terribly important. Pursuit of happiness, what's this? Chasing after haha? <laughs> No, it, it, I mean, uh, pursuit of happiness always seemed to bother me because I never could understand what pursuit of happiness meant. I'm supposed to go look for, <laughs> for what? And I finally decided I couldn't take this any longer, and I looked it up in the dictionary. You know what happiness means? I tell you, it's not a goal. Oh, I don't yes. Think, I don't think it's oh, a goal. Yes. In the, in the dictionary, happiness means luck. Means luck. Happiness means fortune. The pursuit of one's fortunes. Now, that becomes interesting. Because, in other words, one is free to go to find what one's destiny is. At that moment, life, liberty, and the pursuit of one's destiny becomes exceedingly deep, exceedingly important. All right. Now, I follow that and I say, liberty, all right? I've had freedom, I have choices. Life, life, what, what is life? Uh, I, I want to get back to destiny, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I can't let that go so easily. Yes. But life. But you see, for, in music, as a pianist, or as a violinist, or anything else, any other form of making music, I have two hands. And each hand has its own life, as my face has two different sides to it. One uh, is the left side, of course, the sinister one, and the other one is the adroit one, uh, the, uh, the right hand and the left hand. And my, my right hand and my left hand are two parts of a drama where the left hand has one thing to say, and perhaps a voice in between has something to say, and my right hand has something to say, and perhaps a, goes into the agon, the agony, the, the contrast, the battle between the hands. There's where my drama is. I'm no longer with one hand uh, being supercilious over the other hand. Both hands are important. So I must develop both parts of my brain, both parts of my mind. And in so doing, I have started to join my life, which is perhaps one part is violent, and perhaps one part is peaceful. I don't know, but I think a person, many pianists or violinists live half lives in which they bring out their right hand the, the pianist will bring out his right hand to the subservience of the left hand. Perhaps that is what is meant by life, that one has to live both parts of one's life, both part of, parts of one's brain. And maybe in that way, one can get into arguments with oneself in which there is no winner, there is no loser, but that there is a an investigation into tension. into the tensions of life. How you characterize the two aspects of your brain, of your, of your consciousness, your, you said sinister and adroit. Sinister is left and adroit is right. <laughs> and sinister. <laughs> so, uh, what, what do you mean sinister? I mean, 
Sinister. I've heard affective and. No, I, I, do, I do it very simply. I, I just take, I take this, I put this over my face. Over yeah, here. I've seen those pictures. Of one part of my brain, one part of my face, is somewhat straight, and the other one seems to be somewhat cruel and uh, violent. Have you seen those pictures? They, no, I haven't. They do it. You, you've seen the pictures where they take one side of the face and reflect it. Mm-hmm. And it looks totally different. And the different. whole, so your whole and face, your whole figure on you. Oh yeah. Oh yes. If, so if they, you, they take left and then mirror it, so you have two left. It looks diabolic. It looks diabolical. Yeah. And of course, that's the way the egg split. The egg split that way. And so, I look at this and I say to myself. Well, perhaps I should not starve one part of me to feed the other. And perhaps both sides are important. And so this conflict between my hands must be also brought to a rational and uh, beautiful conclusion. So we start to go into, you know, if I'm going to have drama, then on the stage, I, I must never allow one hand to over, over, uh, to be over the other. Then I look at the pedal, and I realize that pedaling is an art unto itself. And then I look at the at the hammers of the of the piano, and I say. What are the hammers there for? Are they really a percussive thing? Or is there a way of making a sound which is ne neither percussive nor, uh, nor with lack of direction? And then I look at the work of the composer. And I say, how did this man write this piece? And the composer was never filling out forms. He was writing music that was started from a blank piece of paper. And on this, he developed something. Which brings us to the notion of Beethoven and the Opus 31, number two sonata. In the 31, number two sonata, the so-called Tempest. D minor. The D minor, the Tempest sonata. And how, did, how was the Tempest written? What was? Tempest about. The story was, apocryphally, that somebody asked Beethoven, what did this piece mean? And he said, read The Tempest. Now, this piece was written somewhere around 1798, 1799, somewhere in that general area. At that time, Schlegel had just made the translations of the Shakespeare plays. Beethoven became very much aware of this Schlegel translation, and obviously had read the Tempest. So now, obviously, what is the Tempest about? Now, it's about a Tempest. Wrong. There is no Tempest in it that I know of except at the very beginning, in which Prospero is shipwrecked on a desert island, and Prospero being not only a scholar, but a magician, looked at this desert island and being a man of enormous possibility, then created a world for himself. Now, if he could create the world for himself, what sense is it to have only a world and not people in it? So he put Ariel in there. He put, he put all kinds of people in there, in this world of his. Well, what is the person who can create a world and put in people, but God. God so in other words, what we're talking about is that Beethoven, the creator, knew of himself as God. Is that arrogance? Certainly not. <laughs> yes, no. It yes, it is. <laughs> not at all arrogant, because personally, it, I thought it was a a kind of uh, an autobiography in which Beethoven and Shakespeare, when you go into a Shakespearean play, he has created the whole world around there. He has created the people in it. He has created what they think, in effect, Beethoven 
and Shakespeare probably were somewhat godly creatures, being creators. And so, now here comes the excitement of what is the Opus 31 number two? But an ability of a man to create his own world. And in so creating his own world, it is up to the performer to try to develop a perception of his senses, a perception of his aesthetic, of what is the world, what aesthetic was used in creating this world. And so, by so doing, what Beethoven had done is given us a perception of a world in which we do not live but which we would like to enter into. In effect, when we go into each of these compositions of all of these great composers, what we're being, what we, what great pleasure we are given by being allowed into a world which we had not conceived, but which had an aesthetic to it, which had a... How do you mean aesthetic? an aesthetic to it. A set of values? No, an aesthetic is a perception of one's senses. For example, if you take an anesthetic, you have a loss of perception of one or more of your senses. Aesthetic. So, if you- An awakening of the senses. Awakening of the senses. Now, there are a number of other aesthetics beside the senses. Uh, this is why we speak uh, about playing with sensibility, playing with sensitivity, playing with sensuality. Play <laughs> All of these have sense in them. That one should smell the aroma of the trees and of the flowers that are within it. That one should be able to taste the, the sound, uh, the, the sound which is all abstract. And yet, in its abstraction, because it has no vocabulary, we are invited into a world that has no boundaries, except the sound, which we communicate with. No boundaries for us. Or for the composer, either one. Because once we enter into a world that has boundary, we're in trouble. But now we go into another abstraction, or another kind of aesthetic. And that is the aesthetic of territory. The territory that a work has. What is its form? In other words, what is its territory? And is the form and the content separate, or are both the same? As I look at you, Jeff, and I see a configuration which is only Jeff, it cannot be duplicated. I look at you, and I say to myself, you are bound, you have boundaries on you, because this, is, this gives me an, an ability to, uh, to uh, know you visually. And you have your boundaries within yourself on the outside. But is there a difference between the way you are, the way you dress, the way you handle your fingers, the way you hold your whole body, and the internalization of the content of what you are. No, they are all the same. So in other words, you are a world unto yourself. With both form and content. Sub sub and substance. Content. Once the substance is gone. Mm -hmm. Is that life? That's right. And that is form the, and substance. Form and substance being the life, the liberty is the choice, and the pursuit of one's destiny. Of where does one go from here until the end? Is it that the, uh, the beginning of Genesis, uh, is it the beginning of the Bible that talks about chaos and form? Yes. Aren't those words in there? Yes. Or am I thinking of other myths?